Hey friends, thanks for clicking on our YouTube message today. I hope it encourages you, I hope it helps you. Our whole church is really about helping you take a step closer to Jesus. So whether you're beginning or you're in the middle, or man, you've been following Jesus for a few years now, we wanna help you. If you enjoyed today, let's make it a regular thing. Uh, we do it every single week at 9 and 10.30. We have live services available. To be notified, give us a like or a subscribe because we would love to hang with you more often. Uh, if you're new here, uh, we would love to know about it. You can actually text on your smartphone uh, or there's a link in the video description uh, to let us know you're new. We would love to just to kind of connect with you, say hi to you, as well as give us a follow on our socials. There's going to be, again, links in the video description. Uh, we would love to connect with you on that. Outside of that, I hope you're doing good. God bless you. We are for you uh, and we want to see you succeed. Peace. He tapped in if Morikawa can extend. And you're not used to seeing that from the three feet, just bangs it through the right edge. See, that proves it's not as easy as it looks, is it? Any golfers here today? Where, where at? Where did I see that at? A few golfers. How's your game? So-so. Eh, We're going to work on that today. Going to come a new anointing. And when I hand these back, these are Pastor Eric's. My son, your hook and your slice will forever be gone after I pray over these today. I just want you to know that. Your golf game may be like mine. I shoot in the 70s. If it gets any hotter than that, I don't play. You have to be a golfer to appreciate that. But this right here represents golf. How many of you have no concept about golf? golf verbiage, golf terminology. Raise your hand. You're really just totally in the dark. That's what I was afraid of. So let me just take a minute and, and, and put it to you this way. These are two clubs that everybody uses. You use a driver and a putter. And this represents long game, short game. Everybody say long game, short game. Now, what you just saw was short game, that little video of that guy putting. That happened to be a guy by the name of Colin Marikawa, and he is a professional golfer. That little three-foot putt, that was a few weeks ago at the Colonial Invitational. He was in a playoff, and because he missed that little three-foot putt, uh, three putt, it cost him $532,500. Everybody say, ouch. So your short game can really cost you. Now, for those that are not golfers, for example, let's say a, a hole is 400 yards long and it's par four, which means your goal should be to try to get it from the tee box from your first shot to, to into that little old tiny hole 400 yards away in four shots. So you want to hit it as far and long as you can with your first shot. And then from there on in, say you hit it 300 yards, another 100 yards, you chip it onto the green. And then you use this little thing, they call it a flat stick, and this thing right here can make you so mad that you want to take it and throw it in the nearest pond. Because you might have hit the greatest drive, best approach shot, you're 30 feet from the hole, but you haven't mastered this short game stuff, and you end up taking four shots just to get it in the hole. That will cost you a lot of money. That's exactly what I'm going to speak to you about this morning. There is a long game and a short game. Now, Pastor Eric just did a great series on in between. I'm going to kind of piggyback onto that today and talk about in between birth and question mark. And when you see birth and question mark, your head probably instantly goes to like, say, a, a grave marker where like born in 1924 and passed in 2001 or something like that. But for the child of God, we don't exactly look at it that way because it's birth and question mark because, yes, that's when you were born, but how many of you realize that living for Christ gives you the assurance you're not going to just live uh, some years on this earth, you're going to live forever. How many of you believe you have a long game ahead of you? How many of you are glad you have an eternal hope in the Lord Jesus Christ? And what I want to speak to you about this morning, my theme would be simply how to live your 
life with a long game perspective. No matter how long the short part of your game is here on this earth, I think you would agree with me, no matter how long a person lives, a follower of Christ, if you live a hundred years, that's this amount of time in comparison to the eternity that God has prepared for you. The Bible says, eye has not seen, ear has not heard, has not entered into the heart of man the things that God has prepared for those who love Him. I have a great aunt that lived to 105, but 105 years, though that's a long time, that is short game compared to the long game of eternity. I'm going to speak to you this morning on how to live life in your short game with a long game perspective. I want to direct your attention to one verse of Scripture written by the Apostle Paul, and then we're going to pray. In Philippians chapter 1, verse number 21, he said, For to me, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for our church family. Thank you for this body of believers. Thank you, Lord God, for the faith that you've allowed us to have in our hearts, whereby we could express that faith in Jesus Christ as our personal Lord and our personal Savior. And it's that faith in Him that sustains us every day. We pray over our church family your blessings. We pray your provision for them. Those that are having some challenging times with what's going on in the world, maybe financially, maybe with their job, I pray, God, give them new answers, give them new solutions. I pray bring them supply from heaven. I ask you, God, for all things to work together for good to them who love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. I pray it in the name of Jesus. Everybody that agrees with me, would you say amen? I want to do a little disclaimer. I've got two points this morning, and I'm going to talk to you about something that's just pretty simple, and I'm going to talk to you from my heart. In fact, I told Pastor Eric back in March when he became the lead pastor, I said, you know, this is home to us. This is our family, and periodically I'll bring a message, but I said, my role is completely changing because my role is no longer lead pastor. God imparts vision to the lead pastor. It's the pastor's responsibility to receive the vision from the Lord and share it with the body and to lead us. And I think he and Natalie are doing an outstanding job leading us through these difficult times. These are not easy times we are living in. But how many of you know God has a solution to everything and he has a plan for everything? He's never been caught without it. So I want to encourage you as your responsibility as part of our church body to pray for our pastors, to pray for them as often as you think of and ask God to fill them with wisdom and knowledge and direction because I don't believe the worst is ahead of us. I believe that for the church, I believe the best days are ahead of us. I read in my Bible that the Lord does not return for a dead, beat-down church. He returns for a glorious church without spot and wrinkle. How many of you are glad you're part of the church of the Lord Jesus Christ? So let, don't let what all's going on in the world change you from believing the very principles of God. And I say that because my first point of two, and I'm going to get right to it, is live your life with a heavenly, eternal perspective. Live your life with a heavenly, eternal perspective. Perspective is nothing more than your viewpoint. It's how you view things. It's how you look at things. The story is told of President Ronald Reagan. Now, obviously, this was a long time ago. He was president in his 70s, and he was speaking to a group of college students, and there was a young man there, a college student, who uh, said something to President Reagan that was recorded. He said to him, Mr. President, it is impossible for you to understand uh, our generation. You, you can't understand us because uh, this young man said, we grew up, Now again, this is like you know, 40 years ago. He said, we grew up with television. We grew up with jet airplanes. We grew up with space travel. We grew up with computers. And we have all of these things to take advantage of. And, and you didn't have them, Mr. President, so you can't understand us. And they say Reagan's reply when he paused was, you're exactly right, son. He said, we didn't have those things when we grew up. He said, we invented them. That sounds kind of tacky, doesn't it? It kind of sounds like pitting one generation against another. That's not my intent, so please hear me out on this. As I pondered that this week when I read it, I thought, I agree with both of them. That young man was exactly right. It's very hard to understand, even though Reagan said we invented them, they didn't grow up with them, so they did not have them every day to form their worldview. So that young man was very right, but obviously uh, Reagan wasn't, his generation wasn't as archaic as that young man might have thought. Both of them were right. My point is this, they both have their own perspective, 
And world experience, life experience, formulates our perspective. And I just felt this would be the time to bring a, a message like this because I told Pastor Eric, I said, in the future when you can lead pastor, if I speak, I'm going to move more to grandpa mode. My wife hates it when I say that, but she is a grandmother, believe it or not. She's a great one. She's a Gigi. She's Gigi. Don't call her grandma. Call her Gigi. But I love my kids, and I love my grandkids. And I said, my role is going to be more like what would I say to my kids and what would I say to my grandkids? Because, you see, you all are family to me. And whether you like it or not, you're stuck with me forever. We're all going to spend eternity together forever. <laughs> I know you clapped because you felt like you had to, but anyway, we get used to the idea. That's, that's what God has planned for. So you're family to me. So if you'll allow me this morning, not, not every time I speak, but today I felt like would be the right time to bring one of those little grandpa talks and just tell you, this is what I tell my kids and my grandkids. And I would tell them two things. One, live your life with an eternal heavenly perspective. Go back to the concept of perspective. Perspective is nothing more than your viewpoint. And your life world experience will formulate your perspective. Everybody has a perspective, and perspective is always changing based on circumstances going on around us. Let's take COVID-19, for example, I think you would have to agree with me that even for the experts, perspective has changed. Just go back to March. We've been hearing this stuff nonstop, 24 hours a day, radio and television since early March, now to early August, and perspective has changed. It was wear a mask, don't wear a mask. You can transmit it this way, you can't transmit it this way. Heat will kill it, heat won't kill it. Perspective keeps changing because information keeps changing. And so I'm not being critical, I'm just saying that's how it works on this earth. Nobody has 100% perfection only God does. So perfection, uh, perception is going to continue to change. I would tell my kids, do not let the perspective of the world create the perspective you have for life. Because if you do, you'll live your life as a schizophrenic. You'll be bouncing here and bouncing here, bouncing here, bouncing here. But I can direct you to one perspective that will not change like that. It is called the eternal, everlasting Word of God. It is infallible. It is unchangeable. And the principles in His Word work in every circumstance. Do you agree with that today? Every circumstance, it works in it. That's where sometimes I have a little challenge when people... I believe God wants us to prosper as our soul prospers and, and to be in health. That's what the Bible tells us. But some people have taken that concept to such extreme. It's from their perspective. Do you know there are places in the world that uh, Pam and I have been that prosperity is to have a peanut butter and jelly sandwich? I've been inside North Korea three times personally. I've seen it. I've experienced it, and I can tell you to just have something good to eat. And there are believers there. They're underground, but there are believers there. But I'm going to tell you their perspective would be a whole lot better, different than maybe our perspective because we are blessed to live in the greatest nation on the face of the earth. In spite of our problems, I still do believe that it is. But if you let what's going on in this world today formulate your perspective, your life will not be what God intends it to be while you're living on this earth. You know why? Because I said this last Sunday in the prayer time. I said we are not created for this earth. We're created for heaven. That's why Jesus told his disciples. Pastor Eric's been doing a great teaching on the Lord's Prayer on Wednesday night in our prayer service. And it's a simple prayer Jesus told us to pray, your kingdom come, heaven come, your will be done. We sang about it today. You know why? Because we're here on this earth, but we just, so to speak, are passing through. The Bible says when you came to Christ in Philippians chapter 3, your citizenship became heaven. How many of you are glad you're going to heaven? Y'all out there, did you go home? I said, how many of you are glad you're going to heaven? Is this what you want? I think you've been singing John Denver too long. Country road, take me home to the place I belong. I can't go that high. West Virginia, is that your goal? I don't know about you. I got, I got my eyes on something a little better than West Virginia or Texas or wherever. And I'm simply saying to you that the perspective of this world will take you to a place that you don't see things like that. We're not supposed to be totally fulfilled on this earth. We were created for heaven, not for earth. 
And I'm going to show you this from the Scripture, from the patriarchs of faith. But that's why sometimes there's a level, a measure of discontent and dissatisfaction. That's why sometimes people maybe get a little disillusioned when a prayer is not answered in the way they thought. Uh, because we weren't designed for the earth. Just like a fish was not designed for land, it was designed for water. It could not be content very long living on land. Just like an eagle was designed for the skies, you put it in a cage. It wasn't designed to live in a cage. It was designed to soar, soar through the skies. You are an eternal being. The Bible says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 23, that you are spirit, soul, and body. And your spirit, man, is going to live forever. You're, you have no ending. You're going to live eternally with the Lord. It's just the beginning today. So whether you live 70, 80, 90, 110 years on this earth, it's short game because you've got a long game in front of you. It's very important how I live my life during that short game and what perspective I have that I carry because we're here for a purpose. Paul said to live as Christ, to die as gain. Realizing that life on earth is temporary should radically alter our values. Listen to these scriptures. Hebrews chapter 11. Many of you are aware that's a chapter on faith. And it lists the patriarchs of faith, many of them. Abraham, Noah, Isaac, David, Daniel. Great people of faith. Listen to what it says in verse 13. All these men died in faith, and women died in faith, not having received the promises. But having seen them afar off, they were assured of them, and they embraced them, and they confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. But verse 16, now they desire a better that is a heavenly country. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God because he has prepared a city for them. All of these people we're talking about, people like David, the king of Israel, a very wealthy man, a very successful man. Abraham, the father of faith, was one of the most wealthy people on planet earth. And some of these people saw mighty things happen in their life. The Bible says how they lived their life, how they lived their short game was having received the promise of what God had, their confession was, well, we're just strangers and pilgrims here. And the Bible uses that word pilgrim. And the word pilgrim in the Greek, it's a combination of three words, here's what it means. A person who's from a foreign country and comes to a city or land to reside by the side of the natives. So in other words, we're to live on this earth among the people of this world to be light and salt, but our citizenship is in heaven. And while we live here, we have our sight set on the fact God has something else for us. And that is what is my anchor in life. I'm an eternal being. I have an eternal God, and I'm going to live my life focused on the fact that, or with the perspective that I have a heavenly, eternal home. Now, what does that mean? Listen to this. 2 Corinthians 4, 18, we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. Since what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. How could Paul write for, to me to live as Christ and to die is gain. I want you to notice that scripture. I want them to put that back up on the screen again. Philippians 1.21. That scripture is so often misquoted. People say, Paul said, to live is Christ, to die is gain. No, he did not. He said, for to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. He said, this is my personal perspective. For me to live is the plan of God for my life. That is Christ. He has a purpose for me being. He wrote that while tethered to Roman soldiers who were threatening to kill him. He writes this letter to believers in Philippi facing executioners in Rome. He's writing to them that here he's in prison, that here he may be executed. He said, I just want you all to know, for to me, this is how I look at it, to live is Christ. I'm going to serve the Lord here in this prison. In fact, he wrote in that epistle about how God used that, and he spent some time there. His execution did not come quickly. He said, I'm going to live my purpose. In other words, I'm not going to live my life focused on dying. I'm going to live my life focused on living. God wants you to live your life not focused on dying. You know, some people have a mentality, well, I'm going to heaven. If I can just tie a knot in the end of the rope and hold on and get there by the hair of my chinny, chin, chin, I'll make it. That's not what God intended. God intended us to be light and salt in the earth. We have a purpose while we are on the earth. For to me to live is Christ, my purpose. I will fulfill my days. This message is not about dying. This message is about living your life because God wants you to live your life. It's not about dying. 
Don't sit around and think about dying. You don't need to. Make your preparation. Be right with God and say, if I live 100 years, praise God. I know what happens when it happens. But I'm not going to focus on that. I'm going to focus on living. You don't have to. The mortality rate's 100%. So you don't have to think about it. It comes to everybody. But all that means is, that's why the in-between was up there with birth and then a question mark. All that means is there'll come a day you'll move out of your body and you'll have a better circumstance. You'll be with the Lord. Somebody said, what's that going to be like? Well, just read your Bible. The Bible says that when Christ appears, we shall be like him for we shall see him as he is. So read the gospel of John and see what his body was like. and You know what you got in your future. But that's the future. That's why modern day my father, who was a believer, he was in his 80s, he'd go to the doctor. Doctor would say, Frank, can't find a thing wrong with you. You might live to be 100. You know what my dad would say, 85, doctor tell him that, you know what he'd say to him? I don't know if I want to live to be 100. And when my dad first told me that, I thought, well, why'd you say that for, dad? Because like I said, our aunt lived to 105. And, but he also knew that the last number of years of her life, she, she kept her mind, but she was incarcerated to a bed and she was blind. And I think it was just kind of like, you know what, I want to live as long as God wants me to, but uh, you know, if that were, I don't care, just it's in the hand of the Lord. And he didn't. At the age of 87, he quickly went to heaven and he lived a long, full life. What could make a man say that? I don't know that I want to live to be a hunter because I know at whatever point I leave this body, it's not going to get worse, it's going to get better. Because for to me, to live is Christ, but to die is gain. How many of you glad you can live your life with that assurance? So don't focus on dying. Let me throw this in. This popped in my mind in the first service. There may be somebody listening that Satan loves to torment you with the thought of dying. Don't let him win that game. I'll tell you a good scripture to memorize that will help you and just quote it back to him. You say, mean quote it to the devil? Absolutely. That's what Jesus did. When Satan came to him to tempt him in, in the wilderness, he said, it is written, it is written, it is written. That's all he did, gave him the Bible. Take Hebrews chapter 2, verses 14 and 15, and memorize, and every time he tries to torment you with the thought of dying prematurely or something, just tell him what the Bible says. It says that through death, Jesus destroyed him that had the power of death, so that we who are living our lives do not live it in fear to the bondage of death. This message is about living your life with an eternal heavenly perspective so you can enjoy everything God wants you to have. Now, to have a perspective that is right I want to give you two suggestions. To live your life every day before God and for it to be fulfilled. Don't let the world form it. Let God's Word form it. And I suggest have a life of discipline. That's a little bit of eh, discipline. Discipline is not a bad thing. Discipline is a good thing. Because the Bible tells us in Proverbs chapter 3 that the Lord corrects everyone he loves. How many of you believe the Lord loves you? Therefore, he corrects you. He corrects everyone he loves. That's good because he does it just as a parent corrects a child they dearly love. My heavenly father loves me and he, 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 he corrects me. And he has stages of correction. And I believe he goes to whatever level he needs to because he has one goal in mind. He wants the best for me. He wants my life to be good, and he wants me to have the hope of eternal life. And if he sees me veering off a path, he'll do whatever he needs to. It might just be a minor correction. He might show me something through the Word. A friend might say something to me. He'll bring discipline. That's what a loving father does. It's just like earthly parents. Have you ever been around a child that was never disciplined? Don't look around. I'm just simply saying, have you ever been around one? You didn't want to be around them, did you? It's not a very enjoyable experience because discipline is an essential. And we have the privilege of disciplining ourselves. And if we don't, then the Father lovingly corrects us. The only way I know to illustrate it is with our fathers. My father was a disciplinarian. My dad was a, a kind of a mild-mannered guy. He was uh, big, strong, a man's man, but he was mild-mannered. Uh, he didn't raise his voice at us, but he had guidelines and rules. I heard Pastor Eric say last Sunday, he was raised in church, and I know his parents, and I, I know what he was talking about. We were I was raised in church, and he talked about, if you were here last Sunday, how his mother would give him that look in church, and when you got that look, you knew you better straighten it up. And I thought when he said, now he was talking about his mother, I'm talking about my dad. My dad didn't bother with looks. He just, he didn't bother with looks. You knew what the rules were. Now, when I was a kid, we all went to church. It wasn't like today where they had children's services. And, and the perspective of, uh, of church was different. But today, 
Uh, we have children's service. Glad we do. They're doing a great job during this time providing packets and information for our kids. And that's what birthed some of this message. Last week, their lesson was on faith or the series on faith for your children. If, if your kids got the packet and the topic last week was heaven. And heaven is something you can't see, but you believe in. How many of you believe heaven is real? It, it birthed a real interesting conversation with me this week. Actually sitting right there last Sunday, our 10-year-old granddaughter, Ella, had her children's ministry service packet in church with her, and I looked at it, and I saw heaven. So after service, I asked them what that was about. I asked Natalie, and they were, they were telling me. And that birthed a little conversation this week between me and my, again, I'm just talking to you out of my heart today, what I tell my kids and grandkids. It gave us opportunity to talk about heaven with Ella, age 10, Josephine, who'll be five next month. And so Ella, when we start talking about heaven, I said, we're going to live forever. Uh, it's, it's what God has planned for us. And Alice said, Poppy, that's boring. Heaven forever? I said, baby, that's because you don't understand heaven. I said, you're 10 years old. You're not going to go into that real deep at this age. But I said, as you get older, you'll read in the Bible where by heaven is described, but only a portion of it. God gave a man named John a revelation. It's called the book of Revelation. And he says, the things that God showed me that are to come, he said, they were so wonderful, I can't even describe them. We don't even totally understand it. We do know the Bible says it has streets paved with gold, gates of pearl, we'll leave eternal seas. Most people think we're going to float around on a cloud strum and a harp for eternity. Yeah, that's boring. That's not what heaven is. Heard one guy say, man, I'm going to be so excited I can get to heaven. I'm going to run three laps around heaven. I said, you ain't going to run anywhere, buddy. I said, you seen how big it is? Just read it in the book of Revelation. I looked at him and thought, you couldn't run three blocks, let alone three laps around heaven. But we don't have the right perspective, the right concept. And as we talked about it, uh, uh, and she said, well, you know, want to go on there. And then the four-year-old Josephine says, well, will there be toys in heaven, Poppy? In other words, I don't want to go anywhere. There are not toys. How many of you have to understand that your perspective is limited here, but you do have enough faith to believe God has something better prepared for you than what we're seeing going on in this world today? That has to be our perspective, to live with that in our minds, in our hearts, to have eternity sealed in our hearts. And so, therefore, I want to discipline myself to be a follower of Christ. If you find yourself getting off the path, don't beat yourself up. Just get back on the path. That's what God wants you to do, not look in your rearview mirror, look forward. And that's why my father would occasionally discipline us. In church, we didn't get a look. How it was in those days, dad sit on the pew, mom, then me. And I'm around the other side of mom. Dad had this way, if you got just rowdy, he could reach around mom with his long arm. And he wore a big old gold ring, and he'd roll that baby around where the big part was here. And he'd reach around and pop you right on the back of the head. And if you got a pop from pop, you knew you'd been popped. You went home with an egg on your head. And if you had a brain in that egg head, you made your little correction and you quit. Because if you didn't respond to that level of discipline, dad could take you to a whole nother level real quick. He didn't do it very often. Now, I need to do a disclaimer. I'm not doing a child raising class here this morning, okay? So you get that from whoever you want. I'm telling you what went on in the king household. You raise your kids however you want. But dad had his own method and his own way. Like I say, don't remember him ever raising his voice or anything. But if you did not respond to the course correction, you went to another level. I want him to show a picture of my dad. Some of you are looking at me like, man, your dad was a beast. He was mean. He's a real nice guy. He don't look mean, does he? He was kind of strong, husky guy. He's, he, he was... Uh, he was a good guy. I don't look like him. I realize most people thought I was adopted, but just so you won't think he's the Antichrist or something, he just wanted his sons, three boys, to live right and to do right. Whether you agree with his form of discipline or not, none of us ever spent a night in jail. I'm not saying it can't happen. Don't get me wrong. But I'm just saying there's reward to discipline. Here's another level would be this. I remember one Sunday coming home from church. Mom had a headache, Dad said, and three boys in the back seat were tearing it up, fighting. I'm the littlest, so I'm in the middle. Dad said, you boys be quiet. Your mother's got a headache. And so he did that, I think, twice. Third time, he never turned around. He just said, that does it. You've had it when you get home. As soon as he said that, a miracle happened in the, in the back seat. You know, the little devils turned into angels and all that stuff, but too late. Everybody say, too late. We got home. We knew what we needed to do. We needed to walk to the back bedroom, to his execution chamber, I call it, where he would execute. 
And my dad didn't do this very often. Knelt over a bed. We knew what to do. He went to the closet. Now, you're knelt down there praying. You're praying more than you've ever prayed before because you've had this before and you know what's coming. He had this big, wide leather belt, and he used it on all three of us. And for some reason, you know, you, you, you start lying. You start saying, Dad, I'm sorry. I'll never do it again. But you're lying. You will because you haven't had a change of heart. You just don't want what's coming. Right. And then sometimes the parent says, oh, son, it hurts me worse. Don't pull that. It hurts me worse than you. They don't get it. They won't get it till they're a parent. Old Chinese proverb, to understand love of father, you must be father. It does hurt more. It does hurt more. Yeah, because, but it's a different kind of hurt. All they're thinking about is their posterior at the moment. And I remember that particular day, I happened to take position number three. For what reason, I don't know. I'm at the end of the bed. He started at position number one, and I'm bent over looking in the face of my older brother, and it's like somebody stuck his fingers into a light bulb uh, switch because his eyes go every time that belt hit him. My dad did that. Again, I'm not doing a child-rearing class, but I can tell you this. We learn discipline in our house. I want to encourage you. Discipline yourself in this sojourn because the fruit and the reward will be better for you, not only in this life, but in the life which is to come. I told you a while ago that I'm just going to do a little bit of a, a grandpa talk. I'm going to do a little bit of meddling right here, and Pastor Eric can fix my mess. Some of you, a lot of talk about social distancing. Some of you need a social distancing in some areas of your life of a different nature. You need to ask yourself about some of your relationships. Are these people improving my life or taking me down a wrong path? Everybody say ouch or oh me. Did you all go home or are you still out there? I can't hear you. But sometimes you have to discipline yourself. We need a social distance. You know, our house, we didn't let just everybody come around. We didn't let everybody, every kid spend the night. There's certain restrictions and limitations that we put because we want the best for our children. And as we become big kids, sometimes we just think we can do anything. Can I just say, be careful what you attach yourself to today because you may regret it tomorrow. Be careful because you may regret it tomorrow. Peter said this in 1 Peter 2, Beloved, I urge you as sojourners and exiles, there's that picture again, abstain from the passions of the flesh which war against your soul. So to have the right perspective, and I told you I only have two points. Don't get nervous. The second one's real short. But another thing for your perspective that will help you is hold the stuff loosely. Hold everything you have loosely because you're not going to take it with you anyway. So just develop an attitude. It's really not mine anyway. I, I came in naked. I'll go out naked. Like somebody said, how much does Sam Walton leave when he died? Everything. How much will Warren Buffett leave when he dies? Somebody says billions. No, he'll leave everything. He'll leave it all. He'll leave everything. So will you. So will I. So therefore, the stuff, hold it very loosely. Don't let that become your world. It's so easy to get on the hamster wheel of life. And don't get me wrong, I love driven and motivated people. But we always have to guard what is our motive. Like, am I living in fear? I'm going to run out of stuff. I can become very greedy and very selfish and hold on to it very tightly. Your life will be more enjoyable if you hold the stuff loosely. If I have it, I'm happy. If I'm not happy. I've traveled for many years, literally around the world. I've been in some very weird places, very challenging places. We lived in the Soviet Union, former Soviet Union. I've been in Cuba, North Korea, places like that where people do not have what we have here. And I'm going to tell you, in some of those unfortunate places, I have met some of the happiest people in the world because it's not the stuff that makes them happy. It'll just keep you in a, in a ball of nerves. Hold the stuff loosely because that way when, when you feel like I, I want to do something with it, you're not worried about it. You know, some people are saving up stuff just so everybody can fight over it. I've seen people fight over jewelry when somebody passed. I've seen them fight over golf clubs, fight over cabinets, fight over grandma's dishes. It's just stuff. Here, take it all. You can have it. God's got more stuff. Hold it very loosely. I'd say this to my kids. Yeah, there'll be somebody greedy come along. You may not get what you thought. You So what? It's just stuff. Look what God has prepared for you on the other side of the short game experience. So I don't need that stuff. If you do live that way, it's easier to give it away if God ever tells you to give something. How many of you enjoy giving? Can I see your hand? Do you know it's fun to give? 
It is fun to give. And I realize we're all motivated different. I, I do understand that. Some people have the motivational gift of giving. My wife says I have that. I don't know if I do or not. But I think it's fun to give. But even if you're a person that loves to give, you do have your threshold where your perspective can change. Where that, mm, I don't know. One time we had something. My wife and I owned something that was, we liked. It was very valuable. And God told me to give it away. And I know where I was when he said it. And I said, get thee behind me, Satan. I thought, that can't be God. Long story short, we did. And you know, that was one of the funnest days of my life, was to give that away because I didn't own it anyway. And did you know that it ended up, we, we ended up with a better one paid for? And I didn't even really ask for it. It just happened that way. I'm not telling you that will happen, but if you'll hold the stuff loosely, it'll take you to another level. Heavenly perspective. Number two, and I told you this is going to be short, live with a heavenly, eternal focus. Perspective and focus is different. Perspective is your viewpoint. Focus is what you lock in on, what you focus on. Focus on what God has for you. Focus on the fact I'm going to live my life for me to live as Christ and to die is gain. We started with a professional golf illustration. I want to wind up with one and a story. A guy named Paul Azinger, professional golfer. Some of you know the name. At the age of 33, 27 years ago, he had just won the PGA Championship, the granddaddy of them all, and right after that was diagnosed with cancer, and fear gripped his heart. Now, Paul was a believer at that point. He had 10 PGA Tour victories to his credit, but he said, when that happened, everything changed. He said, a genuine feeling of fear came over me that I could die from cancer. And he said, the reality hit me even harder that I'm going to die eventually anyway, be it from cancer or something else. It's just a question of when. And Azinger would say to that point, he had lived for golf. But from that point on, no more. All he wanted to do was simply live. He said, one day early in the st stages of taking treatment to deal with the cancer that had attacked his body, he said, I remembered some words I'd heard in a Bible study. And these are the words. The teacher said, we're not in the land of the living going to the land of the dying. We're in the land of the dying trying to get to the land of the living. We're in the land of the dying trying to get to the land of the living. You see, folks, we are not human beings having a spiritual experience. We are spirit beings having a human experience. And that changed every perspective Azinger had. He returned to the PGA Tour. He conquered cancer. He's 60 years old today. He's alive and well. But he said, I'm not saying today that uh, everything changed. He said, but I did learn that happiness is only temporary. He said, and the, I found the only way to true contentment is in a personal relationship with Christ. He said, I'm not saying nothing ever bothers me, but I feel like I found the answer to the six-foot hole. Not the six-foot putt, but the six-foot hole. For to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. I'm going to live with the purpose. I'm going to live with the right perspective. I'm going to live with the right focus.